Well, today we often use the phrase Damascus Road to describe some kind of life-altering experience, completely turning around uh, someone's direction. Uh, and certainly for Paul, it was. And uh, it's, a very, it's very interesting, and certainly it's hard for us to understand Paul if we don't uh, look and understand a little bit about whatever it was that happened to him on the Damascus Road. I've heard people say, well, I think he had sunstroke. You know, he got too hot and he sort of passed out and all he could see was the bright lights. And then he thought God was, you know, all kinds of crazy uh, naturalistic kinds of explanations of what happened on the Damascus Road. And some of our questions and some of the things that seem really unbelievable about the story, I think, do influence sometimes today how we read the story and understand uh, the story of Paul. So I think it's a great place for us uh, to start today just thinking uh, about that turnaround. And it was definitely a turnaround uh, in every way. So, Saul's early life. Well, we actually know uh, a, a good bit, a number of facts about Paul's life before this point. Uh, he's born in Tarsus, a, a Roman city, a Greek-speaking city, uh, which probably meant that he was bilingual, completely bilingual, most likely. Uh, in fact, he might have been better in Greek than in Hebrew, though that he certainly... Uh, had that language too. And so again, the fact that, you know, in comparison or in, really in contrast to uh, the, all the, the Judean and um, Galilean uh, disciples of Jesus who are all native Palestinians, uh, Paul is from a different world. He understands a different world. He grew up, uh, is at home in a very different world than the other uh, followers of Jesus in those early days. He, his family is strongly Jewish and of the tribe of Benjamin. And you know, that the, the Benjamites thought of themselves as one of the better of the tribes, you know, uh, in uh, later Judah is, is uh, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. Uh, and the first king comes from this tribe. Uh, so Paul uh, took great pride in, you know, uh, this heritage that he had. And uh, it's really a part of, of who he was, certainly growing up. This must have been a very important part of how he saw himself. Um, now, unusually, his family had Roman citizenship. He was born a Roman. Um, and... That, that obviously meant there was a certain amount of status and probably wealth. Uh, at that time, a lot of wealthy people would buy their citizenship, so it's possible that his family had bought their citizenship, which would have cost a, you know, a great amount of money uh, in those days. But either way, uh, this plays a lot into his story because, you know, Paul essentially has free passage to anywhere in the Roman Empire that, that he wants to go. Um, he, when he describes his upbringing and his whole perspective of life, we can see that, it, that they were a very devout family. Uh, you know, he, he talks about in Philippians, as to the law, you know, I was faultless. Uh, so a very law-abiding, strict, or we might say orthodox, uh, Jewish upbringing, even though it started off in this pagan uh, city. And uh, based on his own statements, it appears that he probably moved to Jerusalem as a boy. And again, the assumption is um, he, his family, most of his family probably stayed back in Tarsus. Uh, he was sent to learn in the school of Gamaliel, which took children in from different places. And so that's where he goes. So even though his earliest years are in this very pagan environment with, you know, gods and temples and all this kind of stuff, other languages, um, he moved to Jerusalem and he t says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. You know, I'm, I'm very Hebraic in my education and in, in my knowledge. 
those kinds of things. All of that is because he got back to Jerusalem fairly young. And he is trained by Gamaliel. Now, if, if you were in Jewish studies today, you would recognize there's like four great, great teachers in Jewish history, and one of those four is Gamaliel. This is incredible that Paul, you know, just so happened, um, not, not so much, this was, you know, all in God's time, Paul studied under one of the greatest Old Testament scholars to ever live. And so that made him in his younger days a student, but as he got older, it made him into a scholar. And the kind of scholar, as we see in his pattern of ministry, he could go almost anywhere and find, you know, a group of Jews who, um, you know, have a synagogue. And if they find out that he grew up in Gamaliel's school and graduated, they're going to turn over, essentially, you know, be like turning over the pulpit to him, oh, would you, would you teach us? Would you teach us something? Uh, because this was a really a rare privilege to find somebody like that. He is a Pharisee. And, you know, when we read the Gospels, we see the Pharisees are opposed to Jesus, and you know, at least most of them. And, you know, we see this tension and questioning going on. But, you know, the, the reality is that this was a lay movement that was very conservative theologically. They, they wanted to go back to really obeying the law, and they, they believed everything that happened in the Old Testament. Now, they didn't recognize Jesus, most of them, but again, this, this is something to me that if, if I think about it, it is, you know, it's really admirable. Uh, these are people who took the Bible seriously, and they took their faith extremely seriously and they wanted to teach and encourage other people generally not being paid for it almost all the pharisees had their own um, means of support from from a trade or some other business that they ran and again that this all fits into the pattern of paul's life so it's interesting all of these things coming together and then as he describes his own passion about serving God and following God before he met Christ on the Damascus Road. He says, I was zealous. I was ambitious. He was always advancing uh, up the, you know, sort of up the ladder within Judaism and within uh, the Pharisaic circles. Uh, he was one who was very diligent and people noticed because of this great passion and zeal that he had to serve God. And there are other passages, but some of the main passages that the, these things come from are Acts 22 and, and Acts 26 and Philippians 3, uh, partially where Paul is describing what his background actually was before he met Christ on the road to Damascus. So as we read the book of Acts, um, you know, in Acts 5, Gamaliel, Paul's, teacher, his great teacher, you know, is advising the Jews to not attack too harshly this group of Christians. If they're from God, then he's going to protect them and you couldn't destroy it. And if they're not from God, it'll eventually, you know, peter out. Don't worry about it. And then in a couple of chapters later in 758, Paul is assisting in the stoning of Stephen. Something dramatic uh, has happened in those chapters. And, and what could it be? Well, we see in chapter 5 uh, that the Sanhedrin wanted to kill the apostles and Gamaliel counseled them to be cautious or they might be opposing God. But then just a few verses later we see in chapter 6 that the Jerusalem church is growing and even large numbers of priests, Jewish priests from the temple, are coming to faith in Jesus. That's not what the Jews were expecting when, you know, Gamaliel said, well, just leave them alone. They'll probably, you know, just peter out on their own. Now this thing is becoming more and more obvious and it's, grow it's gaining. It's becoming a movement and more and more people we know right around us are becoming followers of this, Je of this Jesus. And then Stephen gets up and preaches powerfully against the Jews for rejecting Jesus and is accused of blasphemy. 
And so this is some of the background now about why all of a sudden now uh, the people in Jerusalem are fighting against this new movement uh, of followers of Jesus. So why was Paul going to Damascus? Well, he, there are several descriptions uh, in, in the New Testament that tell us why he was going, not just that he was going, but what was driving him when he went. And when we put them together, it, oh my goodness, it really uh, gives us quite a picture of what was pushing Paul. In Acts 9, he's breathing out murderous threats. And so he asked for letters from the Jewish leaders that he might take these followers of Jesus as prisoner probably in chains and drag them back to Jerusalem. That was his intention. He states it in these, this way in chapter 22, I persecuted the followers of the way to their death. It wasn't just to get them in prison, you know, and throw them in, in jail for a couple of months so that they might reconsider this thing. No, their intention was this is blasphemy. We're going to kill these pe people. I'm arresting them. I'm throwing them in prison. In prison, I bring prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. And again, without being said, that is to the death. We're going to kill these people. We're going to wipe this out. Or in Acts 26, he says, ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus. He's actually opposing the very name of Jesus, putting many in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. He is actually actively trying to kill and participating in the death of many Christians. I, he went from synagogue to synagogue uh, to have them punished. So you can just imagine these Christians are meeting in a home or, what, or whatever, and Paul is tracking them down, and they burst in uh, and grab them. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I'm going to keep pushing them about their faith in Jesus until they say something that we can now take to a religious court and claim that they are blasphemers and therefore we will kill them. This is what Paul was up to uh, on that trip to Damascus. This is incredible. How intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. Wow. It appears in Acts that Paul might be considered the primary persecutor of Christians in, in this early period. And then on that road to Damascus, he's only going to Damascus to do those things, to track down Jews that might have fled even from Jerusalem. Let's go track them down and bring them back and get them to blaspheme and then kill them. That's where he's going. And then he has this encounter with Christ on the road. Now, certainly this is his conversion. He, he meets Jesus. He has this vision, and he, and he wants to know who this is, and Jesus tells him who he is. And from that moment, Paul is a follower of Jesus, not a persecutor of Christians. He, he's a follower of Jesus. Now, it's interesting that, that a lot of times when I read commentaries, or um, it's mostly in the commentaries, I would say, not so much in biographies of Paul, that that people almost assume that this wasn't really the full call of Paul. And I think the reason for that is that for most of us, uh, especially from established church backgrounds, especially from Christian family backgrounds, conversion and call are something for most of us that happen on separate occasions. You know, maybe I, for me, I accepted Christ personally as my Savior and made Him my Lord. Uh, when I was 15 years old. And that was a big turnaround in my life. And within, I would have known, six months or so, I had this strong sense that God was calling me to ministry. And then it was another three or four years before I realized that He was actually calling me to missions. 
And I think that's probably typical. In fact, you know, I know I hear a lot of pastors, some of my students will say, you know, I grew up in the church, I grew up in the church, I love uh, the Lord, and I'm just going along, and then somewhere, maybe in my early 30s, somebody at church said, well, why don't, you know, have you ever thought about maybe your call to be a pastor or something? And that's, that's pretty typical, I think, for us. Uh, and I think because of that, it, it's really hard for us to, to see that what happened on the road to Damascus was both his conversion to Christ and his call to be a missionary. Um, and again, a, a, lot of, a lot of commentaries sort of downplay the call part and sort of think that this happens later. And, and then this actually plays into how we read some later uh, experiences in the book of Acts. But Paul himself very clearly, repeatedly says that this one event was both his conversion and his call. Once he knew who Jesus was, he had to go and tell others about it. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You will be told what you must do. The identification of Jesus and the fact that there is going to be a task assigned to him are connected together in this very first description of the, the Damascus Road experience. Later, Paul's describing it again, you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. Go and I will send you far away to the nations, to the Gentiles. So this word, I will send you, send, is the Greek word apostello. It's the common word for sending an envoy on a mission. Go do this thing for me, and I'm giving you the authority to do it. And um, it, it, he doesn't use the, the noun version, which is ap apostolos, which is, again, uh, the, the only Greek word for missionary that we have in the New Testament. It's the reason why in our English Bibles we generally do not have the word missionary because we transliterated apostle instead of translated it, which would have probably been uh, in common terminology, missionary. But certainly the concept is right here uh, on the road to Damascus. I will send you so that you will be a sent one. You're going to be a missionary and you're going to the nations. Acts 26, I will rescue you from your own people and the nations. So the Lord tells him right up front, uh, this isn't going to be easy. Uh, there's going to be persecution. Uh, and I'm going to have to actually act to rescue you because you're out there doing this mission that I'm sending you. Again, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. This is the most important task in the world to declare to those who've never heard that Jesus is the way and to call them to come into faith in him and to be his disciples and to take up his purpose. And so, again, Paul is going, and one reason he is so focused is that he's calling people from darkness to light, changed forever, uh, their eternities transformed because of their faith and what Jesus has done for them. So. All of these statements about that Damascus Road experience assume both a conversion and a clear call to ministry. Now, this is, this, this is what raises the question in a lot of people's minds. And I'm not, again, it, it's people in the church, it's like, wow, that's, that's really interesting that it all happened so quickly. Maybe, you know, we, I think we interpret the rest of the story, especially the early parts of it, I'm like, oh, well, Paul's, you know, he, he learned about Jesus and he goes out and does some things, but he's still sort of waiting to really understand what God is calling him to do. Is a complete turnaround like this even possible? 
So even, even some scholars, uh, especially I would say, yeah, early 20th century scholars and others, and some of them still have influence today, um, you know, just sort of seem to doubt that this was really so clear uh, about the call to missions on, at the very moment that he came to faith. And again, I think it's, it's us reading into Paul's story, um, sort of our story. This is not how it's happened. We, though we do know, many of us do know someone who had that kind of turnaround and knew immediately, not only do I have to believe for me, but I have now something that I have to do because I now believe this is true and this is God's purpose for me. Uh, I've had the privilege to see and, and um, interview and talk to multiple uh, men and women uh, among unreached people groups who heard the gospel the very first time, believed, and even in the process of believing, they say, I knew even then that if I believed, I would have to spend my life making sure that all my people or all the people in this province, or, or however, however they see it, uh, also have to know about this. Their conversion and their call came exactly at the same time. I remember talking to a Dulit, a man who was a, had been a new believer about five or six years in India uh, several years ago. Uh, he and the people that he had led to the Lord um, had already started dozens and dozens of churches. And I asked him, I said, so when did you know that you were going to become, you know, sort of a leader of a movement here? Because that's what was happening. And he told me, he says, the minute that I heard that Jesus had died for us and rose again and would make us right with God, I knew that that was news that every one of my people would have to hear. And I said, well, how many of your people are there? He said, well, in this province, there's about 500,000 of us. And I, I'm just looking at him. And this is a man with, you know, barely sixth grade education. And his life was a total mess. I mean, he was an alcoholic about to, about to drink himself to death. The doctors had already told him. Um, and then he got hope. In Jesus Christ and it completely transformed him and he immediately went and started telling all of his friends and families and neighbors about this amazing news this good news uh, that was news to all of them none of them had heard it before and how they started having these same transformations that he had had and I said so how long would it take you to do that to get the gospel out to all of your people he said well if God keeps blessing and we keep working the way we're going, and they're actually multiplying witnesses, disciples, and churches constantly at that time already, he said in between five and ten years, we should have a chance to share the gospel with every one of our 500,000 people who five years before not a single one had ever heard. This kind of turnaround does happen. And we see people who step up and actually become great leaders so quickly because the gospel is powerful and as we see in Paul's life and the ministry that he was involved in. So again, that, he, that man was just one of multiple that I've, that I've talked to and seen. You actually see them doing Pauline kinds of things by just simply boldly declaring in spite of the persecution and getting people together, reading God's Word together, and churches beginning very simply but powerfully, uh, trusting in the Holy Spirit and facing the persecution that comes. When you see these people and you hear them talk, you are, I am, I'm reminded of Paul and I'm reminded of an event that took place on a road out in the middle of nowhere.